Well, awesome. It is so good to see all of you here today. If you are new with us this morning, let me just introduce myself really quick. My name is Pete. I have the absolute joy and privilege of serving as the lead pastor here. And if you are watching this online or listening to the podcast, we pray this message blesses you as well. And we look forward to having you here in person to be a part of the family that God is growing here at Life Church Buffalo. If you're not local to the Buffalo area, I pray you find a Bible believing, Bible teaching church where you can connect yourself and experience the joy and the life that comes from being planted in a house of God. Well, listen, I am so excited to be continuing this series today that we began a few weeks ago called When Pigs Fly. We're talking all about miracles, and we've sort of sarcastically named it that because that's the attitude that many people have when it comes to miracles, that maybe God doesn't do them anymore. If he does, he certainly wouldn't do it for me. Like when pigs fly, it's just not going to happen. But we've been kind of unpacking the different types of miracles over the four weeks of the series. And in week one, in case you missed it, we talked about God's miraculous power over forces of darkness. Last week, we had an incredible move of God as we talked about miracles of healing. And we opened up the altars for people who are believing and asking God for healing either in their bodies or in their souls. And we believe my faith has been stirred this week as we've gotten some testimonies of people that felt that God touched them and healed them. And we are still standing in faith to believe for those that didn't get the healing that they asked for. And listen, if you are here and you believe that God touched you, we would love to hear your story story. We want to be able to celebrate with you and we want to be able to share it with others so that their faith can be built that what God did for you, he can do for them. And so if you experienced a touch from God last, last week, if you got healed, would you send us an email to stories at lifechurchbuffalo.com? We would so greatly appreciate it. But today we're going to continue our discussion looking at the next type of miracle. And I want to ask a question to begin. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer that went something like this? God, if you will save me today, I will serve you forever. Anybody else ever pray that like me? If you save me today, I'll serve you forever. If you like get me past this test, if you help me pass this test, even though I didn't study for it, I'll be so grateful. If you get me out of this speeding ticket today, I promise I'll never speed again, right? If you save me today, I will serve you forever. Today, we're going to talk about God's miraculous power to protect, to rescue, to to heal, to restore. In In Psalm 37, verse 39, David writes this, the Lord rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. God has the power to save, to rescue, to deliver, and to protect in times of trouble. You know, I experienced this firsthand with my family. Last December, my wife and I, at least once a year, like to try to go out on an overnight date. We'll get a hotel room somewhere and have a nice dinner and just spend some quality time focusing on us and our relationship. We'll talk about the future. And while we were on our overnight date, uh, we get a call from my mother-in-law who was watching our children that she had been involved in a car accident where she was driving the boys on the thruway going 65 miles an hour when a 16 point buck darts out, no opportunity for her to stop or slow down. This is what my van turned out to look like in the aftermath of that accident. And in the the next day, I posted on Facebook this picture, and I said, I am so thankful for God's protection over my family and for well-made Honda Odysseys. Kathy and the boys are okay, my van, not so much. And I believed with all my heart, I thanked God for protecting my kids during that accident. But somebody commented on that post on Facebook. I don't know how many of you might have seen it, but they said, does that mean that God didn't protect people who have lost family members in car accidents? Another example of that is back in 2001, my wife was in her junior year of Bible school, and part of that year's curriculum was a required month-long internship with NISM, which is the New York School of Urban Ministry. And so they went to New York City, and after a week or so of training, they were divided into teams. And the seven teams were supposed to be assigned to different parts of New York City and the the different boroughs. And the date was September 11th, 2001. The night before, uh, Kelly and her team were assigned to be at the World Trade Center the very next morning. 
But the teacher, the instructor came to her and her team and said, guys, we've had a really long week of instruction. Instead of reporting to the World Trade Center at 8.30 tomorrow morning, why don't you instead report at one o'clock? You guys can have the morning off. And then as we all know, she and the rest of her team watched from the rooftop of the building they were staying in as not one, but two planes struck the World Trade Center. And she has said many times since, many people have said to her, I have said to her, thank God he protected you from that. Thank God he protected you from that. Which sounds really great until you realize that 2,753 other people died that day. So honestly, it's a little bit hard for me to say that God protected Kelly that morning but didn't protect 2,753 other people that he loved just as much as he loved Kelly. Many of those who died that day were Christians. Did God not protect them, but he did protect Kelly and her team? So I wanna talk today about that tension of a God that we believe has the ability to protect and rescue, but sometimes things just don't turn out the way that we want them to. It's a difficult subject to cover, but I hope to do so in a way today that might answer some of your questions, offer comfort, and at the same time, build our faith in a God that still does miracles. Two big thoughts I wanna give you today, and I'm gonna jump right in with the first thought, which is this. Long before you ever face a problem, we need to understand that God already has a plan. Long before you ever face something unexpected, something difficult, something tragic, our God already has a plan. Long before rain ever flooded the earth, God already had a plan that Noah and his family and the animals would be in a boat. Long before Jonah ever got thrown overboard, God already had a plan to send a big fish to rescue him and take him safely to shore. Long before the Israelites ever got trapped by the Egyptian army with a mountain on one side and a sea in front of them, God already had a plan to part the waters of that sea, enabling them to walk across on dry ground. Long before Joseph ever got thrown into a pit by his brothers and sold to slave traders, God already had a plan to promote Joseph once he got to Egypt to be second in command of the entire nation, thereby saving his whole family from the famine that would come, an entire nation through whom our Messiah would be born. Long before you ever had a problem, God already had a plan. Long before you got the bad news from the doctor and the bad health report, long before you lost your job, long before that guy or that girl broke your heart, God already had a plan. We can see from scripture that God has the power to miraculously save and protect. There's a verse that says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he rescues them. God can shut the mouths of lions. He can calm a raging storm. Long before you ever have a problem, God already has a plan. I wanna share with you this morning a story from scripture that I think illustrates this truth very well. It's found in Acts chapter 16. In case you wanna follow along, this is the same passage of scripture that Bethany Mazur preached from a couple of weeks ago during our Wonder Women series when she talked about Lydia. We find Paul and Silas in Macedonia in one of their missionary journeys here. And uh, they are doing God's work, spreading the message of Jesus everywhere they go. And there's this little story in the middle of Acts 16 where this, there's this girl, this slave girl who is possessed by a demon that gives her the ability somehow to predict the future. And she is following Paul and Silas around. And they kind of tolerate her for a couple days until Paul gets annoyed enough to the point where he turns around, casts the demon out of her, which really upsets her slave owners because like she was their, she was their cash cow. She made them lots and lots of money, but because she now no longer has this ability, these slave owners start to rile up the town. They create this riot and create all sorts of false accusations against Paul and Silas, and we're gonna pick up the story in verse 22 where the crowd is joining in in this attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, 
and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. So Paul and Silas are faithfully serving Jesus, doing what he has called them to do when they are unfairly accused. They are stripped and severely beaten with wooden rods, which Paul should have been exempt from. He was a Roman citizen, and this type of punishment was not supposed to be given to Roman citizens. So if I'm Paul, I'm thinking, what gives God? This isn't fair. I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm being unfairly, un- falsely accused and unfairly treated, stripped and beaten with rods. Maybe you've not been stripped of your clothing, but maybe you're here this morning and feel stripped of hope where you once had a vibrant faith, but something happened in your life and you thought you could trust God, but you feel completely stripped of all hope. Maybe you've not been beaten with wooden rods, but maybe you're here this morning and you feel just completely beaten down by discouragement, by words of discouragement, maybe spoken by other people, maybe spoken by yourself. You're you're feeling completely beaten down by life. Where is God? And for some of you, if you were Paul, you would feel like God had let you down, that he didn't provide a miracle of protection even though it was within his power to do so. It's not fair. I know I've said that before. God, this isn't fair. This isn't how it's supposed to turn out. What did Paul do in this moment? Well, he did what so many people in the church do today. He stopped going to life group. He stopped praying. He stopped going to church. He stopped listening to WDCX radio and only listened to secular music because he was going to prove God who could have saved him but didn't. Of course, I'm joking. Maybe it's getting a little bit tense in here for you guys. (laughs) Hitting too close to home. No, what did Paul do? In verse 25, it says, about midnight at the darkest hour, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. After God didn't miraculously protect them from the unfair accusations and the severe beating and flogging, they're in prison lifting up their voices in praise and worship to God. And the other prisoners are listening to them worship. Verse 26 And suddenly, everyone say suddenly. Suddenly. What I love about our God is he's a God of the suddenly. That even when you don't see a way out, even when you feel locked up, even when you feel stripped of all hope, even when you feel completely beaten down by life, suddenly God can break through and come through with a miracle. He's a God of the suddenly. They're worshiping in prison and suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. You guys, there is power in your praise. When you praise God in the prison, it has the power to not only set you free, but to set those who are in bondage around you free. When we praise him in the prison, it has the power to set people free. Those prisoners that were listening got to experience the miracle. What's so interesting to me about this is that Paul didn't wait for the miracle to happen to worship God. He worshiped God before the miracle ever happened. I'm sure he didn't feel like it. I'm sure he was sore. I'm sure he was in pain. I'm sure he's bruised, bleeding in his jail cell. And yet he and Silas still are offering praise and worship to God. I love what the writer to the Hebrew says, that we are to offer a sacrifice of praise. We don't always feel like it. Some of you may have done that this morning when you came in feeling beaten down by life and you didn't feel like worshiping, but you still offered a sacrifice of praise to God. It's one thing to praise God when you see his power. It's another thing to praise God when you don't. There's two times we're supposed to praise God, when you feel like it and when you don't. When you see the miracle and when you don't. Because we worship him, guys, 
not just for what he does or doesn't do. We worship him for who he is and for what he's already done. Listen, I don't care if God never does another miracle in your life for the rest of your life. He is still worthy and deserving of our praise because he is the lamb of God that was sacrificed for our sins. He saved me, he forgave me, and he set me free. I worship him because he is my redeemer. He is holy. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the alpha and the omega. I worship you, God. You are worthy because you are the lamb that was slain. I worship you because of what you did on that cross. I worship you because you rose from the dead. I worship you because you're my coming king. We worship him for who he is. And I wonder if there's anybody here today that would stand up and take a 15-second praise break and worship him because of who he is is God we love you we worship you you are holy you are altogether lovely we worship you God in this place God we worship you because of who you are we worship you sometimes we've got to offer a sacrifice of praise before you ever see the miracle, just because he's worthy, just because of who he is. Before God ever blessed us with two miracle babies, my wife and I would still offer a sacrifice of praise. Our favorite worship song during that time was the one from Casting Crowns, I will praise you in the storm and I will lift my hands because you are who you are, no matter where I am. We worship him because of who he is and what he's already done. And sometimes it's a sacrifice of praise. As the rest of the story goes, God shows up, there's an earthquake. We learned in week one that a miracle is simply when God in heaven intervenes in the affairs on earth. There's this earthquake, all the prison doors open, everyone's chains miraculously fall off. The Roman guard assumes that the prisoners have all escaped. He wakes up. And uh, knowing he's so duty bound and he knows that once his commanding officer finds out that prisoners escaped on his watch, he's going to be punished, most likely executed. And so he's just going to take his own life. He draws his sword and Paul cries out from the prison cell, don't kill yourself. We're still here. And the jailer is like completely dumbfounded by all of this. Is like, I don't understand. I heard you worshiping God. I've just seen this miracle. You could have escaped. Your God must be real. And then he says, what must I do to be saved? And it says that he takes Paul to his home. Not only does the jailer wind up coming to faith, but his entire family that night believes and is baptized. Not only was Paul saved and rescued from prison, but the jailer and his entire family were saved that night as well. Listen, before Paul ever went to prison, God already had a plan. It was his plan that that jailer and his family come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So it's obvious, obvious to us in this passage that God didn't rescue Paul from the unfair beating but did deliver him from prison. What's not so obvious to us in our lives a lot of times are all the things and ways that God does protect us, that we don't realize he's actually protecting us. Like when we're late for a meeting, heading into work, and we get stuck behind a train that's going by, you're, I don't have time for this. And you don't realize that God might actually be protecting you from what's on the other side of that train. He might be protecting you from a car accident that might happen that school you really wanted to get into or that job you really wanted to have that you didn't get into or that you didn't get. You don't realize that God might be protecting you from what would have happened at that school or six months after getting that job, maybe everyone loses their job and gets laid off. Sometimes we pray for things that we so desperately want that that God doesn't answer and you don't realize he might be protecting you from what you really wanted because we realize that If what we wanted had happened, what God did wouldn't have happened. And we realize later that what God did is so much better than what we thought we wanted. Some of you need to thank God that he didn't let you marry that guy that you really, really wanted to marry. He was protecting you. 
as we get to know the goodness and the faithfulness and the wisdom of God, the longer I follow Jesus, the more I'm convinced that in the times he breaks the chains and opens the prison doors and in the times that he could send an angel to protect us but doesn't, that long before we ever face a problem, God already had a plan. And over time, as we spiritually mature and we grow in our faith and we become more and more like Christ, eventually we learn the second truth I wanna give you today, which is that sometimes God's eternal purposes don't always align with our temporary plans. Sometimes his eternal purposes don't line up with what we want in the moment right now. Think about this. God delivered Paul from prison until he didn't. This is not the only time Paul went to prison. In fact, scholars estimate that he spent anywhere from five and a half to six years in prison. In fact, the after his last missionary journey, he would become imprisoned in Rome and tried by the emperor Nero. And because he was a Roman citizen, he wouldn't undergo the torturous execution of crucifixion, but instead, Paul would be beheaded for his faith. Just like 10 of the other 12 apostles who all died as martyrs, whom God could have protected, did a miracle of protection, but he didn't. Before you ever face a problem, God always has a plan, but we have to understand that sometimes God's eternal purposes, which are higher than our ways and beyond our ability to always comprehend, sometimes his purposes don't line up with our temporary plans. We're not always able to comprehend God's plan when we're in the midst of a trial like this. And honestly, sometimes, guys, the tragedies we hear about or experience firsthand have nothing to do with his eternal purposes and everything to do with the fact that we live in a broken world that suffers from the effects of sin. Its evidence is all around us, and we're engaged in a very real spiritual battle fighting an enemy that wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. We were never promised exemption from tragedy. So sometimes, the baby doesn't make it. And sometimes the drunk driver who's guilty kills the teen in a car accident who's innocent. And sometimes, 2,753 people die in a terrorist attack on our country when he rescues others that day. Does it hurt when these tragedies happen? Of course it does. Do we grieve our earthly loss? Absolutely. Does it feel at times like it's completely devastating and will overwhelm us? Yes, I'm not trying to minimize the grief and the sorrow we feel when we face tragedies like this. But do we continue to trust him in the midst of it? And the answer is yes. If you're a follower of Jesus in whom the spirit of God dwells, yes, we trust him because we worship him, not for what he doesn't or does or doesn't do for us right now. We worship him for who he is and for what he's already done for us. And so how does this play out for us as followers of Jesus? Well, if we believe that God can rescue, then we should pray for divine protection. That's how we apply this. Jesus taught us to pray, God, deliver us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In other words, God, protect us. So we pray for divine protection. I would encourage you to pray for your spouse. Pray for me. Pray for the pastors on staff at this church. Pray for your friends. Pray for your, pray for your kids. Pray that God would protect them 
from the enemy. I always pray almost every night over my kids, God, protect my kids from harm, evil, danger, and major sickness. I try to cover all my bases. Pray that God would protect them from the wrong influences. Pray that he would protect them from the lies of the enemy. Pray this, pray that if they do stray, that they would get caught early. All right, I'm convinced that my mom was praying this way for me when I was growing up because I couldn't do anything wrong without getting caught. Either that or I just really sucked at doing bad stuff. Maybe it's a little bit of both. But we pray for divine protection. I have a mama who has been praying for me from the day I was born and I can't count how many times I believe God has protected me from something devastating that could have happened from the time I was a child. When I was 12 years old, we lived in California. I was riding my bike across a busy four-lane highway with two lanes of traffic going one way and two lanes of traffic going the other way. I made it halfway across the street before I hesitated because the cars were coming faster than I thought they were. And then I started to make my way out and I got hit by a car on my bicycle at 12 years old. And you would think if I'm going this way and the car comes and hits me this way that I would either roll over on top of the car or the force of the impact would throw me in the direction that the car was traveling. But no, when I got hit, I flew 20 feet forward to the side of the road. And I can't explain that except that I believe an angel literally picked me up and threw me to the side of the road because I had a mama praying for me, praying for God's protection. A couple years ago in 2016, before it had been announced to the church that I was going to be moving back to Buffalo, I had come in in January of 2016 for a meeting to meet with Pastor Craig and Pastor Lauren to discuss what this transition plan was going to look like. And on my way from the house where I was staying that morning to the church here where I was going to meet with Pastor Craig and Lauren, I'm driving 55 miles an hour down Armour Duels and some lady getting off the 219 somehow doesn't see me coming and she decides to pull out and we wind up in a head-on collision. The car was destroyed, it was totaled. Airbags went off and when I look at pictures of the car, I don't know how I walked away without even a scratch on my body except to believe that God protected me from what the enemy tried to do in taking me out because he knew what was gonna happen in this church and the lives that were gonna be changed. You know, so much of what has happened in my life, so much of what is good in me as a result too of not only the things that he protected me from, but some of the things that he didn't protect me from. Like God didn't protect me from making a poor choice years ago and marrying the wrong girl for the wrong reasons. He didn't protect me four years later when she decided to leave, which caused me to tailspin, get angry at God and I was hurting and grieving and so I dabbled in drugs and alcohol for a season before finally surrendering and saying, God, I can't do this anymore and I'd go back to church, rededicate my life to the Lord, I'd meet my current wife there and I'd meet Pastor Craig there who would become a spiritual mentor to me. Three years later, he wouldn't protect me from not being picked to become the associate pastor of this church, which would go to Lauren Sperry, who's our executive pastor now. He didn't protect me from not being picked for that, even though for three years I'd been talking with Pastor Craig about that very thing, and that was the plan, but that wasn't God's plan for me. We might have been strategizing for that, but it became obvious that that wasn't God's plan for me. He didn't protect me from that, which a year later made it possible for Kelly and I to accept a position at a growing church in Columbus, Ohio, where we got exposed to church being done in a way that was intentionally focused on reaching people who were far from God, and where I would get the training I needed to become the leader that this church needed to be, because three years later, Pastor Craig would call me up and ask me to pray about moving back to Buffalo to take the reins of the church that he planted. There's a lot that God didn't protect me from. And if this church has done anything good for anybody, you ought to thank God for what he didn't protect me from. Because what he didn't protect me from caused, like, helped steer and, and shape the direction that I went and helped shape who I became today. Before you ever face a problem, we've got to understand that God already has a plan. But sometimes that plan includes pain. 
But I've discovered over my years of following Jesus that I would rather hurt inside of his will than be comfortable outside of his will. You know what Paul never said while he was in prison? Paul never said, God, this isn't fair. Paul never said, God, forget you. I can't trust you. He never said, I'm never going back to church again. I tried religion and it didn't work for me. He never said that. You know what he did say? He said a lot from prison. Actually, four books of the New Testament were written by Paul while he was in prison. Philemon, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians were all written by Paul while sitting in a jail cell. He would write things like, we rejoice in our sufferings. He wrote, even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. He said, I delight in hardships and persecutions and difficulties because when I'm weak, that's when I'm really strong. He wrote, what shall separate us from the love of God? Can trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, can any of these things separate us from God's love? He said, no, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He wrote, we know that in all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. He works in all things. He works in the breakdowns and the breakups. He works in the wins and he works in the losses. He works in the things that you really wanted to happen and he works in the things that you never wanted to happen. Because that's our God. That's why we praise him. We praise him for who he is and what he's already done. He's always good, he's always faithful, and he's always deserving of our praise. God never protected us, guys. Or, I'm sorry, scratch that, rewind. God never promised us protection from all physical harm. That's not scriptural. He never promised that he would always protect us from every tragedy. I got news for you. We're all gonna die someday. 10 out of 10 people die. Our bodies one day will be pushing up daisies. He never promised us protection from all harm. He did promise us that he would always be with us. He promised to never leave us. That's what he promised us. He's always faithful. So if you're someone here today who's experienced a miracle of protection in your life, then praise God. And if you're someone who has experienced the pain of loss from tragedy, we still praise God because we don't praise him for what he does or doesn't do. We praise him for who he is and what he's already done. Because our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs what we experience here on earth. That verse tells us that even, like the fact that we are experiencing pain is actually working for us a reward in heaven that we'll get to experience when we see him face to face. And even if his eternal purposes don't line up with our desire and our plans for what we want him to do in the moment, we could take comfort from knowing that one day we will see him face to face and he'll wipe every tear from our eye. There'll be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering. Long before you ever had a problem, God already had a plan. And so God, I pray for your people this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you are a God who is able to rescue, to protect, to save. Lord, I pray that for those who've wrestled with the questions that come after what we prayed for and asked for don't happen, 
Lord, would you give them the ability to trust, Lord, that you have a plan and that you're always working all things together for our good and for your glory. Lord, would you help us to surrender to your plan? Lord, for those who need a miracle of protection from something happening in their life or in their marriage or in their kids' lives or in their job, Lord, would you send your angels to surround them? Would you rescue them? Lord, would you protect us from every demonic assignment, every attempt or attack of the enemy that would try to keep your plans from coming to fruition in our lives, God. May none of those plans prosper. We thank you that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Lord, that you will complete the work that you've begun in us. That nothing evil will befall us until your perfect plan has been accomplished in our lives. Lord, and as we pray about miracles of protection, we talk about that, your power to rescue, the greatest rescue mission the world has ever seen involved a miracle where God would send his son to become one of us, live a sinless life, and die a sinner's death. And the miracle happened three days after he was crucified when he walked out of that tomb making it possible for us to be rescued from an eternity spent forever separated from God's presence. He did that because he loves you. He made it possible for you to be restored to a relationship with your heavenly father. And if you're here this morning and you're not sure where you stand with God, you've never said the words, Jesus, will you come into my heart? Will you forgive me of my sins? I give you my life. All it takes is a confession with your mouth to say, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. I give you my life. And we could be rescued from our sin and from an eternity spent forever separated from his presence. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you wanna know that you will spend forever with him in heaven one day, will you lift your hands in this place? I see that hand back there. God bless you. I'm proud of you. Over here on the side, I see these two hands. God bless you. I'm so proud of you. Anybody else here today that wants to be rescued from your sin, receive the forgiveness of Jesus, be washed and made new, become a child of God this morning. I see that hand over here as well. I see that hand. God bless you. Miracles of life change are taking place here this morning, church. He's rescuing people. Church, will you join those who have indicated that they are saying yes to Jesus? Will you say these words out loud together with them. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price for my sin. Thank you for rescuing me from myself, from my sin, and from an eternity forever separated from your presence. Forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, make me new. My life is not my own. I give it to you. Be my Savior and my Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the strength and the power to trust you, to follow you, and serve you for the rest of my life. Jesus, thank you for welcoming me into your family. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Church, can we make some noise and join the angels in heaven who are right now throwing a party and celebrating those who were lost and are now found.